very much for the nice introduction. Faster. So you don't think at line level or at the object level anymore, 
you're thinking about concepts. And in your head, you can just assemble these concepts, rearrange them until you solve your problem. It makes you much more efficient to reason about your problems and to solve them. Um, I want to start now by giving you an overview of some of the design patterns, and we will start by not this one. No. We want to have this one disappear. Um, we'll come back to that later. Um, it is unfortunately the only pattern that most people apply, and we'll see a bit later why that does not, uh, not really produce better code. Let's talk about instantiation and factories first. So, instantiation of objects is one of the main aspects of object oriented programming. It's basically, um, if you don't have instantiation, you don't have object oriented programming, you just have classes which don't do much. So, the instantiation is a key factor in building up your object oriented code, um, and you should always think think very hard about where you instantiate and how you instantiate. Instantiation controls coupling. So if you have a place in your code where you write um, object equals new class, then you immediately couple this code to the actual implementation of the class you refer to. If you do any changes to class, if you just rename it, the other code that was using it will break. So that's a hard coupling. And you want to avoid direct coupling as much as possible. Instantiation also controls the life cycle of objects. Um, so if you can, for example, um, avoid instantiating an object, you can be sure that it will not consume uh, too many resources and slow down your program. So the entire life cycle of the application is basically uh, a tree of life cycles of individual objects. And you should uh, very explicitly control that tree and how the uh, individual sub-elements are being instantiated. <coughs> um, the, um, the ways you have to instantiate something uh, are very diverse. So I want to quickly go uh, over some of the ways. So first of all, you have direct instantiation. This is, as I said, object equals new class. Uh, the direct uh, instantiation always produces direct coupling to the class you've referred to. Because you cannot instantiate an interface or something abstract. You can only instantiate actual implementations. It also requires knowledge about the constructor elements. So if your constructor requires an instance of your database driver and an instance of your logger driver, then you need to have them available to even be able to instantiate. Then we have name constructors, which is one small level of abstracting away from the new operator, from the direct instantiation. A uh, name constructor does not really change much. It's basically re re replace the magic construct method by method you can name yourself. It does give a few advantages, though, uh, because you can, for example, have multiple name constructors which uh, allows you to have multiple ways of instantiating one same class. Um, this is very useful, for example, if you're working a lot with exceptions, where uh, multi uh, multiple errors can produce the same exception, and to clean up your code, you can produce a name constructor for each of these uh, error cases. The problem, though, is um, that the name constructor basically then uh, makes you care about the instantiation as well as what the class is actually meant to be. Then we have the first pattern that goes away from the abstract from, from the instantiations that uh, produce direct coupling. This pattern is called the simple factory, and um, we'll see that there are other factories later on. Basically, the simple factory is an object whose responsibility is to create other objects. That sounds very nonsensical at first, so why not just direct and directly instantiate it? Um, the simple factory can, um, uh, will normally just replace the direct coupling to the class instantiating with direct coupling to the factory that will instantiate your class. <coughs> 
However, as the simple factory is an object itself, it can be injected. So you can use it indirectly, which is the first, uh, first benefit of using objects. Um, so here's an example. Um, we have code that, um, imagine you want to provide a feed that generates uh, a, a widget that generates a feed of a social network. But you want to have an option where you can switch to which network you use. You can use Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatsoever. Um, you could, of course, uh, develop this in such a way that you have a big switch statement somewhere and in your actual logic you're going through all possible mechanisms. But every time you want to add uh, another uh, network, you will just grow your code indefinitely. So, so the simple, simple factory is basically um, um, an object that takes away the instantiation and you can then produce multiple uh, implementations of the same interface and the consuming code will just retrieve what, what the factory produced and use it because it knows that it will adhere to this interface, the render feed. So the social network is some social network that uh, the factory returned. We don't know the exact object and we just use it. If we now want to add another social network to the bunch, if we now want to add Instagram, for example, we can add a new implementation of the social network we can add it to the factory, but the consuming code does not need to be changed. It can still instantiate whatever type you need and use it. So this piece of the code is, uh, is built once, is tested once, and doesn't need to change from that point on. Then we have the abstract factory. The abstract factory um, is basically one uh, abstraction step further where instead of dealing with a specific factory that can return some implementations, you're actually dealing with an abstract factory that can have multiple different implementations of the factories which in turn can produce different objects. This sounds very complicated now. And I didn't produce code sample for this one because it, it's really more complex code and it doesn't fit slides very well. But I tried to express it in a diagram. So basically, the abstract factory, let's think about Gutenberg blocks in this case. Let's say our Gutenberg editor has some built-in uh, blocks you can use. And the blocks are instantiated through factories. So if you say I now need a paragraph block, then the abstract factory will know how to choose the factory to use and then use the right factory to instantiate the correct block. And whatever you get from the abstract block factory will be some object in implementing the block interface. The big advantage of this is that our factory is not extensible. So in our plugin, we can now produce a new implementation of the factory, register that with the system, and all of a sudden we have additional types of blocks we can uh, create while not changing anything else from the consuming code. It still just works. It's basically all the special logic is contained within the plugin. The actual Gutenberg editor does not need to be adapted to make this work. Um, as you can see with these factories, um, in general, making something more abstract makes it more flexible. You, you need to pay attention though, because sometimes um, it's not always the best way to start with abstractions up front, because abstractions, they, they add additional complexity, additional overhead, and they, they are only useful, therefore, if you actually make the benefit of uh, having the abstraction this uh, if there's no benefit to be had, then just having more complex code is actually a drawback. So always know, uh, always try to get a feel for where are abstractions needed and where can we just, for example, use a simple factory to start out 
and then later on, if I notice that we have something that limits our flexibility, only then use the extract factory instead. So don't always start with the extract factory. Um, so with these factories, the question is, when should you even directly instantiate? Just assume the, um, the basic premise of having object-oriented code is that everything is properly decoupled so that if you do a change in one place, you don't need to change in another place uh, to, uh, to avoid side effects. This is why uh, the direct coupling, the direct instantiation, um, um, the direct coupling that it produces should normally be avoided. You can use the new uh, operator though if you instantiate the newable types, which are usually value objects, uh, which are exceptions, uh, or patterns like the simple factory, for example, can all also be um, directly instantiated uh, when that makes sense. Also, inside of the factory, of course, you can use direct instantiation. That's the main reason why you have them. So, the next pattern I want to talk about is the template method. The template method um, is basically like, like a recipe. You build an object, and that object already has in its main method all the calls it needs to do and in which order it needs to do them. And the methods that it calls, they are abstract or, uh, or you can override them. So basically, the main structure of how the code is being executed is predefined and you can replace the steps that you want to change. The, um, here's an example of the template method. It looks a bit more messy. Um, basically what I built here is a payment gateway and for payment gateways usually um, the, the general procedure is always the same. You cannot start with uh, charging the credit card if you don't have the payment details yet. So there's a certain, uh, certain set of um, restrictions in place and a certain set of older uh, requirements that you have. That's why in the template method, um, you can, um, uh, wait, uh, sorry, um, uh, I want to first show you what the procedural version would be. So the procedural version would basically be this. Uh, no, this is for a template method, I'm sorry. So the template method uh, is the checkout here. The checkout contains specific steps of how to do uh, a checkout through the payment gateway. And these specific steps, as you can see at the bottom, they are abstract functions. And the specific pay the payment gateway, like the PayPal gateway, for example, can then extend the gateway and just provide the, those implementations it needs. And the basic process of running through the checkout uh, will still be the same. So for example, here we added basic logging to log each separate step, and in our PayPal gateway, um, this is just being reused because we didn't override the actual template method, the checkout method. This is still the same one from the base object. We only override the individual steps. Uh, the template method um, is usually not something you start with the front. It's mostly you start with one or two implementations of a given problem. And then when you have these implementations, you look at what the common requirements are. And then slowly start to refactor, and this will distill your template method uh, with time. It's also very important to think about uh, how to name your method names and uh, what signatures to use, what type declarations to use, um, because that will uh, basically be the documentation you give to someone who wants to extend that object. So if your naming is unclear, they don't really know how to extend it and will probably uh, produce the wrong implementation that causes bugs. So the clearer your naming is, and the more strict your type declarations are in your method signatures, um, the more robust the, the actual implementations uh, will become. You should also consider using value objects, which is a pattern we'll discuss later, to uh, further harden uh, the signatures instead of using 
uh, scalar values like an int or string. If you have a, a function argument with lots of values that are very ambiguous, then it's very easy to get it wrong when you extend it. Uh, the decorator is another pattern we want to cover. Um, it serves to uh, add a specific role, a specific responsibility to existing objects. So first, let's think about uh, caching. Caching is what you would call a cross-cutting concern. Cross-cutting concern is something that you cannot easily put into one object in one place and just have it work there. It's usually something that will go throughout the entire code base. Caching is one of the cross-cutting concern. Logging is one of the cross-cutting concern. You cannot have one object in one specific area that will do the logging and all the rest of the code never bother with it. It's more that in each piece of your code you have some logging information in there. That's what you call a cross-cutting concern. Cross-cutting concerns are very problematic uh, to deal with in object-oriented code uh, because they go against what you normally try to achieve by encapsulating your code and separating everything in clean objects. They, they basically run through an entire layer of objects at once. So where would you put the caching logic, for example, to cache a remote data request? Um, you would normally want to have a solution where neither the code that does the request needs to care about caching, nor the code that uses what was requested needs to, uh, needs to care about the caching. That's where the decorator comes in, into play. So it wraps an object and can add responsibilities on top of it without the rest of the code needing to change. Um, think about uh, an interface. Let's say we have an interface, get data or something, to, to fetch our remote data. Normally, your code would have a consumer and a producer. The producer will implement the interface to produce whatever the interface uh, guarantees, and the consumer will fetch the result from that interface and just use it as is. The decorator works by first splitting this up and uh, going in between these two objects and then implementing the interface itself. So basically, the consumer and the producer, they both did not need to change. It's just your existing code. It might be an external library that you're not even allowed to change, that you don't have, maybe you don't even have access to the code. Not everything is open source. So the decorator works by still uh, being able to modify the behavior of existing objects without actually changing their, their code. Here's an example of how that would work. So we have an interface uh, data, uh, to get data. Uh, we have an implementation that does the remote request. We have a renderer that can fetch that data and render it. And here's how you set it up. So we instantiate the remote data fetcher, we instantiate the renderer which gets an instance of the data fetcher, and then the renderer can render. This will then uh, first call the this data get, so the remote request will be executed and then return some random result. To um, do caching, normally you would end up with code like this. So your caching is part of the remote data. So the, the actual logic, this one call, is obfuscated by all the caching logic you're wrapping around it, which makes your code very messy and very, uh, uh, very difficult to reason about. Um, for the slides, it's very small code. Imagine having uh, bigger source files. If all of your methods end up uh, dealing with caching logic like this, you will have trouble actually finding out what, what the real logic uh, of the object is. What does it try to solve ex uh, except from caching? So to do this with a decorator, you would create a new implementation of data that receives uh, a data object and then wraps its logic around it. So we have clean logic again in our actual uh, data class. We didn't change the renderer and to use it we basically create a data object 
we create, we create cache data by wrapping the cache data object around the data object, and then we can still go on from there and just use the renderer and render it. So if you remember from the first slide from these examples, neither the remote data code nor the renderer code has changed. We have all the caching logic in here, in a separate object. Um, this makes sense for, um, for working with cross-cutting concerns, as I said. It's sometimes also useful for, for different areas, but cross-cutting concerns are the most obvious ones. And uh, the uh, decorator works best if you can couple it with a dependency injection container, which means that you have one central place where you configure how your objects will be instantiated. Because then, in that one central place, you can just say, okay, whenever I, I need remote data, I return cached remote data instead. And that's it. The rest of the code doesn't need to care whether caching is active or not. The template view. The template view is something that uh, I wish WordPress would use more often. Um, it's basically a pattern that lets you uh, separate the concern of how to fetch data from the concern of how to present that data by basically producing a template with placeholders and then for any given set of data you replace these placeholders with the actual data. It, it sounds very simple, it's a very simple concept. Here you can see an example. Uh, we have a set of data in here, um, so we want to render a, a movie entry. Um, we have a template that tells us how a movie should be rendered, and you can see that this template has placeholders in here for the title, subtitle, and description. And then we have a view class, which is uh, how the, the template uh, view um, design pattern actually is implemented. So here's a very basic uh, version that uses built-in PHP templating mechanisms to work. So basically, our view class gets uh, the name of a view to use, make sure that name is valid, and then when you want to render something, it uh, fetches the context, the data you want to use for your placeholders. And then uh, here we're using output buffering to do the rendering. This could also be something like Twig or Mustache or any other rendering engine. Um, that's whatever you, you prefer. Here we're using basic PHP to just include our template file and PHP itself will then replace the placeholders. And to use it, it's basically uh, we instantiate a new view with the template we want to use and then we can render it with a given set of data. That's it. So the data is separate from the template and it's very easy to, uh, um, to adapt either one or the other separately. Some tips for using template view. Uh, I would recommend building view object yourself uh, because uh, to make the best use of it, there's lots of details that go into building it so that you can, for example, switch out the rendering engine, etc. Uh, so I would recommend using a, a pre-built library for that. You should use relative paths that point to your uh, template files or some sort of identifiers, not absolute paths, because then you can build um, uh, an override mechanism where, for example, you can build a plugin that has its default templates in a template folder inside of the plugin, but when you provide them in your child theme, it will use them instead, instead of those in the plugin. So always prefer to use relative paths for that, then you can re reroute the template's uh, location to, to point to a different place. <coughs> Also, uh, you should think about allowing for nested rendering of these views because instead of having an entire checkout page uh, view, you could have a checkout page view that has a, a, a card area with a button view, etc. Then you can replace individual uh, sub-views uh, if you want to override something instead of always needing to override the entire thing, the entire page. Then we get to the strategy pattern. So the strategy pattern um, is basically, uh, it allows you to abstract away 
differences in a given set of logic so that you just run your logic irregardless of which specific variation you want to use. Um, the, you can always add different strategies later on and um, make it so that the code that actually runs your logic is not aware of what uh, strategy is currently being used. Here's an example of the strategy pattern. Uh, first we have um, the normal code without using the pattern. So we, uh, in this example we have a user list and we want to be able to print that user list in multiple different ways of ordering it. So for example you can have, uh, have it ordered by name, you can have it ordered by email, but you might also have an ordering, for example, where you group the telephone numbers by showing the local te telephone numbers first and then the international numbers. So you might have more complex logic than only deciding what column to sort it out. In this case, the, uh, the code uh, produced has one sort uh, function that is pretty big. It uses a switch statement to decide which algorithm to use and then shows all of the algorithms that are available and you can see when we use it um, for example we print the user list sorted by phone then it will go to this switch statement and look at how to sort etc. So to use the strategy pattern we want to extract this bit, the switch statement and have this be separate objects instead. So here you, you see there's lots going on here, that's just because I happen to use three different ways of sorting. Uh, but the general code is not that complicated. We still have, have our user list, and you can see that when we want, want to have it sorted, we give it a criteria of how to sort. It's an object. And it then just passes the users to this object's compare method. So this is basically we, we prepared an interface that has the logic, in this case a compare method, and this interface we can then implement it. We have a sort by name implementation, we have a sort by email implementation, and we have a sort by phone implementation, which is a more complex one. And you can imagine all sorts of other ways of comparing these elements. You might have uh, all sorts of more complex uh, use cases still, where it's just a matter of adding one more implementation of this interface. And to use this interface, it's basically uh, just instead of giving uh, the get sorted by method um, some sort of identifier, we pass it the actual criteria to use. So we tell the user list to, to have it be sorted by the sort by phone logic. So we have encapsulated our logic into an object. And we can pass that object around, we can extend that object, replace it, etc. Um, oftentimes, the strategy pattern is an obvious fit if you have huge switch statements or entire chains of if else statements. Uh, most of the time, you can use one, uh, one of the many variations of the strategy pattern to clean up this code and have the logic be separated into multiple separate objects. And of course you can, um, you can also uh, combine this with other patterns. So in this case, for example, we had uh, the uh, consuming code needed to be aware of the different criteria. Uh, it had a direct coupling to the sort by phone class, for example. But if you combine this now again with a factory, you can get rid of that direct coupling and have the factory just know, okay, it's the phone field we want to sort by and the factory return, will return the sort by phone object. The null object. So the null object uh, sounds like a very useless object uh, at first glance, but it's actually uh, one, of, one of the objects that can drastically change the way you code. Um, think about error conditions in your code. Usually when, when you build something that can fail, that can break, you will end up having all sorts of if-else statements. 
So uh, if the result is a WP error, then do this. If the result is false or null, then do that. Uh, which again causes your logic. You might have two or three lines of logic, and you end up with 30 lines of error in your code before you can even trigger that logic. The um, null object is a way of, um, of getting around that problem by creating an object that's created in these error conditions to just have neutral behavior. So neutral behavior depends on the context. For example, if you want to create a view to render something from a template, but you happen to not find that template, instead of, instead of producing errors, you could return a null view that will just render nothing. So your error conditions are gone. You of, you, of course, have to think about whether architecturally it makes sense to render nothing or whether you would prefer to really throw an error. But oftentimes, for, for code on the front end, for example, errors are just not good, so you prefer to not break. Um, the null view could also return the error string to just show what happened without breaking. Um, here's an example of using the null object. We have, uh, as I said now, with a view. Normally, when you instantiate your view, if it is not valid, you might think about returning false, for example. So if you return false, you have a problem in the code that uses your view. Because if the code just blindly uses it, here we will call the render method on false, which immediately causes a PHP fatal error. So usually you will end up with code like this. So you will always have branching code that first checks whether your objects are valid and only uses them when they are valid. The null object uh, can, can avoid this by producing a neutral view and returning that neutral view instead of false when something is off, when, when you hit an error condition. And again, we can now just just blindly call the render method, and there's no way it can break. So the worst case scenario has turned from a PHP fatal error into an empty output, which is always preferable. Well, um, except if you want to have the errors. Um, so on the front end code, it would always be preferable, I would say, uh, like that. Uh, some usage tips for the null object. Um, oftentimes, having switch statements when you have the default case, it's not obvious what to put in there. Uh, that's a good fit, for example, to think about an all object. Uh, also, uh, for any objects where the entire code path is meant to always run through, uh, so you don't want, to, uh, don't want to throw exceptions or print error messages, you want to have it be uh, robust, uh, then you can use null objects. And um, it's also a good case for just catching exceptions and then uh, turning them, them into something that's still usable uh, in terms of that it is an object that you can call methods on. So it's also a good, um, uh, a good candidate for filling up your uh, catch clauses um, in your try-catch blocks. Um, now we get to the value object. I already hinted uh, at um, that specific design pattern. The value object basically uh, turns um, all your types that your domain object, uh, that your business domain can contain, into actual objects. So if you're dealing with an email address um, and you just store it as a string and pass it around as a string, <coughs> you never have the guarantee that, you're, that that is actually an email address that you get in the next piece of code. So we have several methods where one passes a string to the other. Um, every method will probably need to check whether it actually is an email address that was passed. Otherwise, whatever it might want to do with that email address might randomly break. If you want to extract the domain from an email uh, address, for example, and you actually don't have an email address, the extraction will break and not produce a meaningful result. You might end up with a null value and then use that null value to pass on to the next method. 
Uh, having value objects lets you uh, encapsulate the validation logic into an object that you can then transport around. And you can use that object uh, to, um, uh, to, um, for, for your type declarations. So whenever you then use that value object, you have a guarantee that what you get is actually what you think uh, you have. So here's an example of a value object. Uh, I picked up uh, the email um, example. So the value object basically turns a string into an object that contains validation logic, which is still stored as a string. So in terms of how the data is persisted, it does not uh, change much. But we now have guaranteed validation. You can only instantiate the value object if it is valid, otherwise it will throw an exception, immediately letting you know that there's something off here. Uh, we were supposed to get an email address, but what we got was not the email address, so the logic is wrong. We need to check the logic again. Um, you can also add actual methods to this object of how to deal with that specific value object. So instead of having the code to extract the domain part from an email, Instead of having that be in the consuming logic, you can put it into the value object and code it once and then just reuse it. And here you can see an email sender object that, uh, where you can add email addresses and it just stores them. It does no validation whatsoever because if it, type, uh, if it uses a type declaration of an email address, there's no way it could get something else than a pre-validated email address. So it makes your code very simple, and you will get immediate errors when your data is not to, to what you expected it to be. And here you can see an example of how we're using this. So instantiate our email sender. Um, here we're using Amazon, for example, to send emails. And then we can add new emails and send them. And the validation is properly encapsulated within the concept of the email address. Only the email address knows how to validate email addresses. Only the email address knows how to fetch the domain part of an email address. And that's it. The rest of the code just uses it. Um, mutable value objects uh, should be used with care, though. They can uh, cause something that's called aliasing bugs. So, we have an example here. Uh, we have Doc Brown, who is stuck in the past, and we have Marty McFly, who is 30 years ahead. So to code this up, we use a point in time, we set that time for Doc Brown, and we add 30 years to that time and set it for Marty McFly. Although now, when we, when we actually print our dates, all of a sudden, both are present in 1985. So what happened? Well, the actual thing is that we added, um, we added 30 years to the point in time which was an object reference. And both Doc Brown and Marty used that same object reference for their point in time. So actually, if you change one, the other changes as well, because there is only one object here. And when we add 30 years to it, it's changed in both cases. Okay. That's why you should always uh, prefer immutable value objects instead. Immutability means that once an object has been instantiated, you cannot change it any, uh, anymore. If you want to change it, this will create a new instance of the object. So here we're using daytime <coughs> immutable instead of the normal daytime. Uh, by the way, both of these objects are part of normal PHP language. And with the daytime immutable, when we do our add operation here, this add operation actually returns a new daytime object instead of using, uh, instead of returning a changed version of the previous one. So we have two daytime objects that are now being used, and we get the correct uh, dates uh, when we want to print them. Uh, this is something that's very important. This is why immutability is such an important uh, factor in uh, doing software development. Because the more complex your systems gets, 
uh, the more difficult it is to actually diagnose bugs like this. And it's very important to be aware that when you're dealing with objects, they are not copied by value, they are copied uh, by reference, so they are passed by reference, not by value. Um, so if you uh, pass an object uh, to some method, it is passed by reference and uh, not copied like every way it is. Um, so, some tips for the value objects, um, use them with abundance, use them for all your type declarations. Um, nowadays, if you're using modern PHP code, you can really work by almost exclusively using objects instead of any scalar values. If you have an int, an integer value somewhere, why not, why not think about what concept that int represents and then create an object for it that contains its own validation? If you have an array, why not turn it into a collection of specific objects? Uh, using objects in that way makes your code far more robust and it's also, it helps with static analysis. So for example, if you use an IDE like PHP Storm, if you only use objects and very strict type declarations, PHP Storm itself will immediately let you know when you have a logic error in your code. Because it's obvious that there is a mismatch between what you expected to get and what you actually got. Um, you should, as I already said, also prefer immutability and uh, make sure that, um, that you're always aware that the value objects uh, always share the same instance if you just uh, move them around. Um, the next design pattern is the proxy. Uh, the proxy pattern is a, 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 an object that takes the place of another object and can uh, forward calls uh, from the, uh, to the proxy to that other object. It is used, for example, uh, to replace an object that's very expensive to instantiate by a very cheap, small weight proxy, and then only when the proxy is being hit by a request, you actually instantiate the expensive uh, object. So here's an example of the proxy. We have a, a database implementation that, as you can see, does a very expensive initialization. Uh, so if we, if we just use this code as is, you can see we instantiate our uh, database, we pass the database into the plugin, and then add actions. Um, the actions might never be triggered, so that code might never be needed, but we nevertheless needed to instantiate our database to be able to pass it into the plugin, because the plugin required the database to work through dependency injection. So to avoid this very expensive initialization of front and only do it when it's actually needed, which might be very uh, rarely the case, we can use a proxy. So the proxy basically implements the same interface and it can forward calls to the real object. And in this case, we, we store an instance of the database and only instantiate it when you have an actual query. So here we then pass the database proxy to the plugin instead of the normal database. We still do our normal action calls, etc. And what this now does is if we do a web request that runs through the entire code and then just triggers stuff to do, which is this code path, it will never initialize the database because it was not needed. It was not hit by an actual query, so it will never be initialized. So the very expensive initialization was not actually done during the web request. Only when we do a web request that needs the database, it will trigger the initialization. Um, here's uh, another way of writing a proxy that is a more clever hack of PHP internals. Um, 
I, I go back to the previous one just to show what, what we actually want to avoid. So here you can see that for each query we do, we have a condition first that checks whether our database was initialized or not. And if we happen to do 5 million queries in one request, we will do 5 million, uh, 5 million uh, conditionals to always check whether our database was set or not. So we can avoid this by do doing a construct like this. So our query will just use the database and forward the query. But if you look closely, you see that we don't have a property database in here. So the property database does not actually exist. But we have magic gather that when a property is being requested that doesn't exist, it checks whether it was actually the database, and then uh, adds the property dynamically with the reference to the database. So the next time, the database property will exist, and that magic method will not run. So this way, we have avoided having the conditional run with every query. Um, be aware, though, that this is uh, only needed if you actually have performance issues because of these conditionals, because that's more in the territory, territory of hex than it is of clean code. Some usage tips. First of all, um, don't code proxies by hand if you can avoid it. Uh, there's a really great uh, library that's mature and tested and used everywhere in, uh, in PHP frameworks and libraries. That's the proxy, proxy manager library, uh, which basically gives you all sorts of different types of proxies uh, readily built and tested and all, uh, all bugs already fixed. Also, um, you should not use proxies through an entire tree, but rather uh, replace the root of one subtree by a proxy, which will then trigger building on the entire rest of the tree. So use it strategically instead of using it for everything. The observer pattern. Uh, I think this should be the last pattern we'll see now. The observer pattern is basically uh, a notification mechanism where uh, the one who wants to have the notification and the one who sends the notification are decoupled. Uh, so you have a subject and your server, the subject does something and your server wants to be notified when the subject does that thing. Uh, this is similar to the concept of publishers and subscribers, but not exactly the same thing in terms of the pattern. The publish subscribe pattern is actually a variation of this, and the publish subscribe pattern uh, does not directly have uh, the observer and the subject communicate like in the observer pattern, but rather has uh, some form of channel, some form of grouping in between uh, to, uh, to uh, have an indirect communication between these two. So here's the differences between these two. As you can see, your server pattern has a direct coupling between these two, uh, or a direct relationship between these two, let's say, as a coupling. And the public subscribe goes through channels. Uh, so the subscriber subscribes to a channel, and the publisher will publish an event into one or more channels. So when, a, when an event is being published into one or more channels, one or more subscribers will be notified. And you actually know um, a procedural implementation of the publish subscribe uh, pattern, namely the uh, plugin API in WordPress core, which provides actions. <coughs> so you can think of actions as a channel. And you have multiple subscribers that can add action to a specific action. And then you have a publisher that does a do action to actually trigger the channel. So the plugin API with its, with its actions is actually a procedural implementation of the publish subscribe pattern. Yes, so here we are again with our favorite pattern, the singleton. Uh, here's what I want to say about the singleton, because everyone seems to use it. It breaks the single responsibility principle. It breaks the open-close principle. 
it breaks the Lisca substitution principle. It doesn't break the interface segregation principle just because it doesn't have an interface, it didn't get a chance to break it. And it breaks the dependency inversion principle. So four out of five of the solid principles, which are basically uh, what are the cornerstones of clean modular OOP development. So the singleton is really bad. <laughs> Please don't use it. You can pretty much always replace it with factories or other patterns we've seen here. There is no uh, hard rule uh, that makes you need to use a singleton. It is it's just a pattern that's, that happened to have been in the book I described uh, before from the Game of Four, but everyone nowadays considered, considers it to be an empty pattern, not a real pattern. So even books contain errors, this seems to be one. There's a link at the bottom of uh, this slide uh, which goes into more detail about the singleton, why should we avoid it, and multiple ways of replacing it with something more useful. The key takeaways from this talk. Design patterns are a concept and a tool. They are not specific pieces of code. They are not something you can copy-paste into your code. So if you go to a website that contains design pattern examples, don't copy an example and paste it in your code. It will not work. It will not do much. You might end up with a rubber duck in your code or a car factory or something. Um, design patterns simplify communication. It allows you to very efficiently communicate with the rest of your team. Um, you can talk to them by saying uh, the factory that we produced uh, should return value objects instead of uh, something else. Uh, we need a proxy in here to uh, improve performance and make the code more scalable, etc. Et so it's a very efficient form of discussing high level concepts. And uh, again, with some time, it will shape your thinking and you will actually think in this more efficient way uh, using these design patterns. If you want to start using design patterns, I recommend looking into these first. Uh, these are um, pretty simple to use in uh, normal code, especially using a factory. It will improve your code by decoupling everything. This will make you more flexible to experiment with patterns, so you can return one pattern, see what it does, and if it doesn't work, return a different pattern. Uh, the template method makes everything more structured in terms of uh, what, uh, what other people need to deal with when you want to extend your code. The decorator lets you extract uh, nasty logic like caching and logging out of your uh, proper business logic. And the template view lets you decouple the rendering from the data uh, preparation and lets you easily change uh, the way your, code, uh, your, your front end rendering is done later on. Um, here's some references. Um, the first one is the book that started it all. The second one is a book that contains a lot of additional patterns. Uh, that are mostly useful for, uh, that, that are mostly explained in the, con in the context of enterprise application architecture, but the patterns are always valid no matter where you use them. And if you happen to uh, use them in a mobile game, then uh, if they produce cleaner code, then uh, yeah, all the better. There is also a learning resource. Uh, this is GitHub repository. We it with lots of useful PHP resources, and they have a big section on design patterns. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much.
practicals in WordPress core um, that mostly deal with performance issues. And for example, for these performance issues, um, oftentimes the proxy pattern is very valuable. To, to give you an example, um, the translation system in Word, WordPress basically makes it so that if you use underscore underscore and the string, uh, it's a function call that will return the translated version of that string. The problem with that approach is that as soon as that code is hit, the translation is being requested, even if it might not be used. And this causes performance issues like, for example, in the REST API, when the item schema is built, it contains lots of description fields, with every description field being a translation, and this causes weird effects like doing a REST API request to fetch the post title of the first post on your site, and this will trigger 3,000 translations behind the scenes that are never being used. Uh, so, for example, um, in this context, I, uh, I produced a string proxy and then had the an implementation of the translated string proxy. So the underscore underscore method actually returns an object that if you cast it to a string, if you want to, and if you turn it into an echo statement or so, it will actually then trigger the translation and re will return it. But if you just instantiate the object and pass it around, and never render it somewhere, the translation is never being triggered. So that's, that's uh, one example of how you can use these design patterns in the procedural WordPress core legacy code. It's easy to change the query to, to apply a set pattern? Uh, it's easy to change it. <laughs> it's not so easy to change it without breaking something. Um, so in, in this example, um, uh, I had to uh, update some of the unit tests because the unit tests did a direct check to see if they got the string because they were not interested in having a translation, they were interested in having the string type. Uh, so these tests had to be updated. But there were also some weird use cases in the regional code where translations for, uh, for the month names were done, for example, and then the translations were being used uh, as uh, indexes into an array to produce the next set of translations. And you cannot use such a string proxy object uh, as, a, as an index into an array, for example. Uh, that doesn't work. Thanks. So some things need to be adapted. Hey, uh, so not directly related to design patterns. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on your thoughts for the future of WPCLI and your thoughts on WPCLI becoming a WordPress.org project that happened last year, I think, or something like that. Um, <coughs> feel free to hit me up after the talk. Uh, I think that's <laughs> completely out of scope now for discussion, but just feel free to hit me up uh, later on. Uh, we'll discuss this during a cup of coffee. 